Praise God. Hey, thank you so much. You know, it was difficult to find that in a key that was very high. And the highest key could find is still not high enough for her. Elvis did not sing with a soprano voice. <laughs> but Eddie, it was beautiful. Have you ever had one of those things that like, stuck in your mind and wished it? I, I keep going back to that joke about uh, Forrest Gump when he got to heaven. And, and it, Peter asked him what his what God's name was. And he said, Andy. He said, Andy, why is it Andy? Andy walks with me. I can't get it out of my mind. I wish I could. Anyway, as most of you know, and again, I'm so grateful for you here. And we truly do care about you. If you need anything, the phone number that's on the church is my cell phone number. So if you call me directly. And if I can't answer right away, I promise you, I'll call you back as soon as I can. Anyway, as most of you know, a couple weeks ago, we started a series called Majoring in the Minors. And the idea is that we become familiar with some of the parts of the Bible that we often overlook. I mean, we even talk about how uh, we don't visit the minor prophets' house you know, very much, how lonely they must be. I mean, we always seem to go to Mark's house and John's house and Luke's house, and sometimes we even visit their cousins, like the, the, the big prophets, like Daniel and Isaiah. But seldom do we go to the minor prophets. So... I'm just thinking that maybe there's going to be something in these minor prophets that's going to help you get through tomorrow. Maybe something you need next week. Maybe Habakkuk or Haggai or Hosea or maybe today as we look at Zephaniah. And we found out that they're called minor prophets not because of their content, not because of their prophecies. They're certainly not minor. They're minor because of their size. For example, Zephaniah, we're looking at today, only has three chapters. And it's it's sort of like going through Selbyville on your way to the beach. You know, if you ain't paying attention, you're going to miss it, okay? So, as I've been studying these minor prophets, you know, I began sometimes to question, why in the world would I do a subject that on this? Why would I share the message on, on this portion of the Bible? It seems like that minor prophets almost delight and they almost feed upon giving judgment and wrath. They give judgment and then judgment and then more judgment and even more judgment. It's almost as if they have some kind of fiendish delight in that. But really, as I've been studying, as God has touched my heart, what I've been finding out are these are as much the truths of God as anything else in the scriptures. And we don't always like to hear what God has to say about his wrath and his judgment. Because we live in a society that is sort of watered down the Word of God. You can do anything you want, call yourself a Christian, and still get to heaven. You can come to an altar, sign a card, raise your hand, and go out and live any kind of way you want, and God's grace and mercy will cover you. We say God is a God of wrath, God is a God of judgment in the Old Testament, but we live in New Testament time, and God is a God of grace, and God is a God of mercy in the New Testament. But the author of the book of Hebrews, which is found in the New Testament, chapter 13, verse 8, declares, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And we know that Jesus Christ is the, the second part of the triune God. He is God, God in the body, the Father incarnate, who is made in human form, 100% man and 100% God. The God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we need to hear these truths of God. And we saw the truths of God in the book of Nahum. Our God is long-suffering. Our God is patient. Our God is a good God. He's a stronghold in the days of trouble. But he will not acquit the wicked. He will not let the evil go unpunished. And if we don't know, if we can't understand God's judgment and God's wrath, in reality, his mercy and his grace and his love will mean nothing to us. If we can't understand who we are and what we deserve, we can't understand how much God loves us and, and what he sacrificed because of his love and his grace and his mercy. And then last week we looked at the book of Michael and wherever we looked, if you read the book of Michael, he is everywhere. Jesus is everywhere in the book of Michael. Prophecy after prophecy of a coming Messiah, a coming Savior of the world. Jesus Christ, the spitting one. Jesus Christ, the babe of Bethlehem. Jesus Christ, the everlasting ruler. Jesus Christ, the God appointed ruler. Jesus Christ, our peace. Jesus is all over and all throughout the book of Micah. And Micah's message is the same today as it was then. We listen to God, but we don't really listen to God. We hear God's word, but we don't hear God's word. And he's got this thought, we need to pay attention. 
to the Word of God with our ears. And we need to retain the Word of God with our minds. And we need to respond to the Word of God with our hearts. And we're beginning to see, and we're beginning to understand that we're studying these minor prophets. They do indeed speak the truths of God. It's just sometimes the truth of God is the reality of God. Is that God, he's a God who just does not like sin. He hates sin. And if we don't come to him, if we're not willing to respond to him, if we don't accept his son, Jesus Christ, if God doesn't see a converted heart, if we don't confess Jesus Christ to be our Lord and Savior, then we're going to face his wrath and his judgment. So this morning we're going to be in the book of Zephaniah. And, and before you go scrambling for your table of contents in your Bible, just go to the last book of the Old Testament, which is the book of Malachi, and work backwards. It's Malachi, Zechariah, which will be in next week, Haggai, and Zephaniah. And as we study these books of the minor prophets, there's really no way we can do an in-depth study. We'd spend years. But my objective is that your curiosity will become peaked, and you'll begin to know the desires of God's heart. And my hope and prayer is that you'll start to work these books of the minor prophets into your personal study time so that you can know all the truths of God. Now, this is what I know. This is what I think you know. Every single book of the Bible is designed to point us towards Jesus Christ each book of the Bible is to reveal something about Jesus that we don't get in any other book of Holy Scripture. If we got the same thing in every book, then we only need one book. But God, in his uh, uh, a great everlasting love for us, he gave us 66 books of the Bible. And each one of us, each one of them, shows us a new truth of Jesus Christ. If there was a book missing from our Bibles, there would be something missing that we need to learn about Jesus Christ. So as we begin to study the book of Zephaniah, we start by asking ourselves, what is the distinct revelation of Zephaniah? What revelation of Jesus Christ would we be missing if we didn't have the book of Zephaniah in our Bibles? What is the big picture? What was on God's heart when he inspired Zephaniah to write this book and to give this prophecy? So, this morning is really more of a teaching lesson than a preaching lesson. For those of you who like information, today is going to be a great day for you. Uh, if you like the happy, jump up in the air preaching messages, well, maybe next week. Maybe not. I haven't got there yet. But the interesting thing about Zephaniah is he actually starts out with this genealogy in verse 1. The Lord gave this message to Zephaniah when Josiah, son of Ammon, was king of Judah. Zephaniah was the son of Cushi son of Gedaliah, and of Amariah, son of Hezekiah. Now, I believe this is important for two reasons. First of all, like I said, Zephaniah gives us his gener gener you know, genealogy, his family tree, and God doesn't do this in any other book of the Minor Prophets. This is the only book where God gives the genealogy of the prophet. He doesn't do it in the book of Jonah, he doesn't do it in the book of Nahum, he didn't do it in the book of Micah. And the second reason I think this is important is Zephaniah, most of commentators believe he came from royal blood. He was the son of Pethaziah, who was the king of Israel. In other words, Zephaniah came from a royal line. He had royal blood. In 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 5, it tells us this. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. King Hezekiah was one of the very few godly kings that ruled over Israel. Maybe you remember from Sunday school or possibly from a message you heard in church, Hezekiah is the king who became so sick, he became so ill, that God told him he was going to die. And Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed. And God said, Hezekiah, I'll give you 15 more years. God answered his prayer and gave him a longer life. you got to be careful what you pray for. you got to be careful what you pray for. During this 15-year extension of Hezekiah's life, Hezekiah had a son by the name Manasseh. And Manasseh would rule Israel for 55 years. And this is what God's word says about Manasseh. 2 Kings chapter 21, verse 2. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight. Following the detestable practices of the pagan nations that the Lord had driven from the land ahead of the Israelites. See, Manasseh was not a nice guy at all. He was not a nice guy at all. As we go into verse 6, this is what it says. 
Manassas also sanctified his, or sacrificed his own son. He put his own son in the fire. He practiced sorcery. He practiced divination. And he consulted with mediums and psychics. He did much that was evil in the Lord's sight, arousing his anger. Manasseh wouldn't even have been born had God not answered Hezekiah's prayer. Verse 11 and 12 goes on. King Manasseh of Judah had done many detestable things. See, he's even more wicked than the Amorites. The Amorites were attacking and killing the Israelites. And the Bible says that Manasseh was even more wicked than they were who lived in the land before it. But he has caused the people of Judah to sin with his idols. So this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I will bring such a disaster on Jerusalem and Judah that the ears of those that hear about it will tingle with horror. Now let me tell you something. If your ears are going to tingle with horror just by hearing what has been done, that has to be a pretty bad disaster. This is the wrath and the judgment of God who is serious about sin. Not only did Heaven's guy have a son after the Lord answered his prior, Manassas had a son. And his son is described in 2 Kings chapter 21 as well in verse 16. Manasseh also murdered many innocent people until Jerusalem was filled from one end to the other with innocent blood. This was in addition to the sin that he caused the people of Judah to commit, leading them to do what was evil in the Lord's sight. So again, that's Manasseh being a bad guy. Sorry about that. But again, we come to the next verse. Uh, verse 16 is what I've got on here, but that's probably wrong. Go ahead, Jay. Let me see what's next up here. Verse 20, 20 22. He did what was evil in the sight, just as his father. Okay, so, yeah, we're talking about Manasseh has a son. His son was named Amai, I believe, and he followed the example of his father, worshiping the same models as his father worshiped. He abandoned the Lord, the God of his ancestors, and he refused to follow the Lord's prayer, or Lord's son. He refused to do the Lord's sight. So, anyway, I get back on track here. When it came to, the, here's what's happened. When it comes to the pagan gods, Israelites, they didn't, they didn't really have any discretion at all. They would worship just about anything. They weren't choosy. They sacrificed children, their own children. The king sacrificed his own son as part of their worship rituals. They got involved in astrology. They worshiped the sun, the moon, the stars. They worshiped everything but the one true God. Zephaniah was probably written in the king in the days of King Josiah. We know that from, from some of the scripture. And the king of Josiah, Josiah was the king of Judah. And uh, I don't know if you know this, but he was Hezekiah's great-great-grandson. And after Solomon died, the king of Israel was split into two kings. It was divided into a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. Israel was in the north and Judah was in the south. And Josiah came to the throne of Judah when he was only eight years old. He was a very young boy when he took over the throne. This was right around 640 B.C. And by the time he had turned 16, King Josiah had begun to turn his heart towards the Lord. By the age of 22, he was purposely and methodically and actively tearing down the high places of the pagan gods. King Josiah was trying once again to restore the, the Jehovah, to restore Judah to worshiping Jehovah, the one true king. And he even went about uh, building back the temples. Uh, that were to worship Jehovah, the one true God. And as he began to clean the temples up and restore them to the glory of God, one day as they were cleaning out the temple and repairing the temple of God, the high priest, a man by the name of Hilkiah, came across a book that had been hidden, a book that had not been seen, a book that had not been read in over 50 years. 2 Kings chapter 22, verse uh, 10 records it like this. He did Shaphan... Go ahead, Jim. Shaphan also told the king, Hilkiah the priest was given me a scroll. So Shaphan read it to the king. So Shaphan finds this scroll that, that nobody has read, nobody's seen for 50 years, and it's scripture. And he reads it to King Josiah. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, there is a revival in Judah. The word of God has transformed Josiah. True, Josiah was truly converted. He was a changed man by the word of God. Now, I would think, and I speak as a fool, that if I were God, I think I'd sort of like that. All right, now, this is what I've been waiting for. I finally got a king on the throne who's going to lead this nation right back to me. 
this is what I've been waiting for. But God sends his prophet Zephaniah to tell God's people what is right over the horizon. As a friend of God, a true prophet is always going to tell you what's going to happen, no matter how good it is or no matter how bad it is. And the message seems to be like this. I know Josiah is a good king, and I know I can expect a righteous reign from the son of David. So you would expect a prophecy of mercy and grace, but this is not what you do to God. You ever watch one of those movies where something is about to go really, really wrong? You know, a volcano is about to erupt, an earthquake is about to happen, a nuclear power plant is trying to blow up, and there's this one person in the movie that's trying with everything they got in them to warn everybody about what's going to happen, trying to get them to understand. Well, this is Zephaniah. Zephaniah was probably the last prophet to speak to Israel before they were taken into Babylonian captivity. And you would expect God to withhold judgment. I mean, they've got a converted king on the throne. But God doesn't do this. Josiah's a changed man. He has the whole nation now worshiping Jehovah, the one true God. And the fruit of it is showing in Josiah's life. The reality of repentance was evident in Josiah's life. But God did not speak of mercy. He spoke of judgment and wrath. Here's what about to happen. Zephaniah 1, chapter 2 through 4, or verses 1, chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, record what's about to happen. I will sweep away everything from the face of the earth, says the Lord. I will sweep away the people and the animals alike. I will sweep away the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea. I will reduce the wicked to heaps of rubble, and I will wipe humanity from the face of the earth, says the Lord. I will crush Judah and Jerusalem with my fist and destroy the last trace of their pale worship. I will put an end to their adulterous priests, so even the memory of them will be erased, will disappear. And in this, we see in the book of Zephaniah, Zephaniah actually gives two different prophecies. One of them was fulfilled in ancient times, and the second one were predictions of a future judgment upon the entire earth, which we are still waiting for. Zephaniah tells of the judgment of both his people and the people of Israel what's going to happen in their lifetime. But he also says this judgment that's been placed upon Israel in Zephaniah's time period will be magnified to include the entire earth on the day that Jesus Christ comes back to claim the church. And this will be a universal judgment. Zephaniah looks through the telescope of time to a future judgment that we haven't seen yet. And really, when you look at this repentant king, you would not expect this prophecy. We would expect, a, you know, he's repentant. We would expect a, a, a prophecy of grace and mercy. I mean, in the time of Abraham, God said, if there were only ten righteous to be found in Sodom and Gomorrah, I won't destroy the city. In the book of Jonah, there wasn't a revival like we see here, yet God spared the city of Nineveh. And here you have a converted king making a public vow, and yet in chapter 1, verse 12, Zephaniah prophesies, I will search the lanterns in Jerusalem in the darkest corners to punish those who sit complacent, that's in court word, complacent in their sins. They think the Lord will do nothing to them, either good or bad. It's not what I expected from a God when revival is going on. And this is what I believe was on God's heart. This is what I believe that he sent Zephaniah as a woman to Israel. And if you miss this point of Zephaniah, you sort of miss the entire book of, of Zephaniah. Zephaniah starts out about God's wrath against sinners, especially those people who claim to belong to God, but don't serve him with their whole heart. It's a warning. And since this is a warning from God himself, we not only have to hear it, like we learned in Micah last week, we need to hear the Word of God, we need to pay attention to the Word of God, and we need to respond to the Word of God. I think what Zephaniah is talking to is about those people who come to church but are complacent. Those who don't serve God with their heart, and they think God's going to do nothing about it, either good or bad. Zephaniah is telling the ones, those of us who claim to be Christians but don't serve, the people just sit in the pews in the churches, he's calling them sinners and calling these sinners to repent. God is saying, yeah, Josiah, I see that you're a changed man, but really, when I look throughout the land, you're the only one. I see the hearts of everybody else, and it's just all outward form. 
I mean, they don't really mean it. They're just going through the motions. All the changes, all they went through, it was not a true heartfelt revival. It's just lip service. It's all external. It's just a ritual. Only you, King Josiah, have had a heartfelt revival. The problem may be nationwide, but the solution, the solution is only as big as each person's heart. Each person has to make a choice. Each one of them, like each one of us, has to make our minds up to obey God. And then we have to take this from our minds and move it into our hearts. In other words, just as we learned last week, we need to listen, we need to pay attention, and we need to respond to what God has told us to do. God's discipline purges evil. God's discipline motivates us to return to him. And Zephaniah is warning the people of Judah of this impending judgment for their sin, even the sin of complacency. We don't think of complacency as being a sin. Zephaniah is hoping to stir their hearts to repentance before it's too late. I mean, Zephaniah is a tough book. It's the severity of God. It's a book of judgment. But strangely, strangely, it has some of the greatest pictures of God's love, and God's grace, and God's mercy that you see in the minor prophets. It doesn't end like it begins. See, the Lord presented two ways in the book of Zephaniah. Yes, it's a book of the severity of God, but it's also a book of the tenderness of God. We peer through the dark judgment of God. We look through the gloom and doom of God. And when we do, we see the light of God. After the darkness, God shines a glorious light. God speaks clearly to his people. You come to church, you go to Bible study, you give them your tithes and offerings. But if you're just going through the motions, if you really don't mean it, if your heart is not in it, you don't have a true heartfelt revival, and a day of judgment is coming. And I don't like to read this. I don't like to preach this. But it's in God's Word. And I think sometimes, how often do we rationalize the things that we're doing? How often do we justify those things that are not just? I mean, we make up politically correct names for things, don't we? Euthanasia, alternative lifestyle, cohabitation. The list just keeps going on and on. Pro-choice. Zephaniah was addressing the same problems that we face today. Idolatry. I wouldn't call it a lot of different things, but anything which has more influence on your life than God does is idolatry. Whether it's our friends, whether it's our jobs, whether it's our habits, whether it's our hobbies, if it has more influence on your life than God has on your life, it's idolatry. Zephaniah is dealing with the people who were abused and misused. He was dealing with the poor who were being ignored. Justice was being perverted. He was dealing with deceit on a national level. The politicians and the, and the preachers had become spin doctors. Much like today, people trusted in their riches more than they trusted in God. Like today, if you'd ask most of the people in Zephaniah's time, just like if you'd ask most of the people today what their future security is, most people are going to tell you about their bank accounts, they're going to tell you about their savings accounts, they're going to tell you about their properties. Today we live in retirement plans and 401ks, but most people won't mention the only real security we have is in Christ Jesus. And all the sins of Judah are the sins of the world today. And it's scary because God has promised to judge the entire earth and all the people on it. And yet most people still live as they please, but there's coming a time when the Lord calls each one of us. We had three deaths that were related to the church this week alone. Two funerals, Thursday and Friday, back to back. And I don't know the time or the hour, but I do know this. Each one of us in here, each one listening, we're all one day closer today than we were yesterday. And you might be sitting there listening and thinking, just like the Israelites said, you may be thinking, well, I'm not living so bad. But there'll be a day when you have to give an account. There'll be a day when you're going to be judged for your actions or your inactions. A lot of us get involved in things and we try to convince ourselves they're okay. We say things like, you know, I really don't see anything wrong with this or that. Everybody else seems to be doing it. We try to find a loophole in God's Word. I don't know if any of you remember W.C. Fields or not. W.C. Fields was a devout atheist. The one day on his deathbed, right before he died, one of his friends comes in and finds him sitting on the bed reading the Bible. And he looked at him and said, W.C., you don't believe in God. What are you doing reading the Bible? He said, looking for loopholes, looking for loopholes. <laughs> I mean, 
mean, I think that's how we are today. You know what I mean? We try to find the loopholes. And maybe sometimes we try to rationalize our sin. And we try to make it look like it's not so bad. At least it's not as bad as it looks on the outside. Maybe we'll get our friends to join in. I remember as a kid, I get my friends to join in, and I get their approval that it must be okay. And Zephaniah is here to tell us, God doesn't say it's okay. Zephaniah reminds us that God is wise to our heart. God is wise to our actions. God would not ignore what we do or what we don't do. Our sin will be addressed. And this is the reality of God's judgment. God warns us, so thank God he warns us that his judgment is coming. And God is going to start... Here's the amazing thing. God's going to start with his own people. He's going to start with those of us who call ourselves Christian. God will start with the house of God. He'll start with the ones that call ourselves Christians, but only going through the motions. When God is about to start a revival, he disciplines to awaken his own people. And if he will do this to his own people, the ones who claim to know him, think how much more he will do that the people who deny him. If he'll do so much to cleanse us, think how much more he will do to those who deny him. And then Zephaniah, he peers through the darkness. And even though the main theme of Zephaniah is judgment, there are so many glimmers of light, there are glimmers of hope, there are repeated references. References like, in that day, in that time. Zephaniah is looking forward, not only to the day of God's judgment, not only to the day of God's wrath, but he's looking forward to the day of God's wrath, of God's grace. A day that he's looking forward to, of God's mercy and God's love and God's blessing. God, Zephaniah sees a day of God's salvation upon the earth. Four times God tells Zephaniah in these three chapters, he says, Tell my people I will save out a remnant, although the Babylonians will come, although the nation is going into captivity. I will save a remnant. And we have to listen to it. We have to pay attention. We have to respond to what God is saying. We need to ask ourselves, each one of us need to ask ourselves this, this, this thought-provoking question. Will I be one of the remnant? Will I listen and will I pay attention and will I respond to the word of God? When God leaves his remnant, will I be one of the remnant? God says, my people will survive. Chapter 3, verse 9, Zephaniah is speaking as the Lord. Then I will purify the speech of all people so that everyone can worship the Lord together. The New International Version translates like this. Then I will purify the lips of the people that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve him shoulder to shoulder. See, in the midst of judgment, God points out hope. God loves us so much. You, me, he loves each one of us so much. He said, don't just look at the negative. Don't look at just what's possible. Don't overlook the possible. Don't miss the joyful. So how do you get through the darkness? How do you get into the light? How do we move from the judgment of God to the mercy of God? And the answer is so simple <coughs> that we miss it. If we want to see the light through the darkness, we simply need to seek the Lord with all our heart and all our mind and all our soul and all our strength. It's simple, straightforward word of advice. Chapter 3, verse 8 says, Therefore, be patient, says the Lord. Be patient in the belief that God knows what he's doing. Verse 9 and 10 says, Serve him and worship him. Verse 12 says, Trust in him. Verse 14, Be glad and rejoice in him with all your heart. And when you do those things, when you do those things, we get verse 10. For the Lord will remove his hand in judgment and will disperse the armies of your enemies. And the Lord himself, the king of Israel, will live among you. At last your troubles will be over and you will never again fear disaster. And when you get verse 10, when you get verse 15, it's so amazing. You also get verse 17. And this may be the most awesome, the greatest verse in all of life. For the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty Savior. He's mighty to save. He will take delight in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm all your heart, and he will rejoice over you with joyful singing. It's the only place in the Bible, in the entire Bible, where God sings. And he isn't singing over the universe he created, and he isn't singing over the stars or the planet. He's not even singing over all the beauty he made on earth. He's singing over you, and he's singing over me. 
And isn't this the message of the gospel? Isn't this the entire message God has given us in this love letter we call our Bible? Even though we deserve judgment, even though we deserve wrath, God gives us mercy, He gives us grace, He gives us forgiveness. Though we sin, God's mercy, God has mercy, and God has pardon. Pardon for you and pardon for me. They're, they're right there in the midst of judgment, right there in the midst of wrath. It says God is for you, He's not against you. God is for us, not against us. He promises us favor rather than wrath. God gives us blessings rather than curses. Some people are skeptical, and I know that. It, you know, many are. The attitude's been around for a long, long time. It's too easy just to say Christ. You may be skeptical. And you may be saying, Lord, we'll do nothing, either good or bad. I live the way I want. I accept it, and I believe in it. He still loves me. But by the fact that you're here this morning, if that's you, it means he's still waiting for you. How much longer God will wait, I don't know. But I do know if you're in here this morning, if you're listening this morning, there's still time. Today can be the day of salvation, be the salvation of God. This is the only book in the Bible where we hear God singing. And you can be, this is so, I love that you can be deceived by the world or you can be serenaded by God. Which do you prefer? The choice is yours. Nobody can make it for you. Your mama can't, your daddy can't, your friends can't. You have to make it yourself. But it's still available to every person who hears this message. By faith, we are united by Jesus Christ. And as a result of that faith, when God looks upon us, those of us who are in Jesus Christ, he only sees his son. We don't serve a God who was alive and then died and was buried. We serve a God who was dead and buried and now is alive. Jesus conquered the grave. He rose and conquered the grave as we sung this morning. The death of Jesus Christ on the Roman cross was made as an eternal sacrifice for our sins. We serve a risen Savior. The tomb is empty. By Christ's death on the cross, there's no longer a chasm between a simple man or a simple woman and a holy God. For those of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as both our Lord and our Savior, God looks upon us, not as his enemy, but as his creation. Not as his enemy, but as we sung this morning, we become friends of God. What cancels our death? What cancels the wrath of God? What cancels the judgment of God? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. The death of our Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ and faith in Him to do what we could not do on our own, cancel our sin debt to a holy God. We receive mercy and we receive grace once we enter into the arms of Jesus. But I'm here to warn you, Zephaniah's warning, if you're complacent, you're not in the arms of Jesus. And if you have not put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, you're not in the arms of Jesus. And you will face judgment. Maybe there's somebody in the sound of my voice before today. You had never heard of God's wrath or God's judgment. But now that you know, now that you've heard the truth, what will you do with it? The great day of the Lord is near and coming quickly. Give your life over to Jesus Christ. Surrender to him. Trust Him with your future. And you can rejoice in the Lord always. There is no gift that God has ever given us that is greater than His gift of salvation. If He never gave us anything else, it's more than we deserve. And He gave us this gift of salvation through the life, the death, and the resurrection of His only Son, Jesus the Christ. And our hope is in a God who is eternal. A God who was before time, matter, and space. Our hope is in a God who is rejoicing and singing over us. And when we allow God to rejoice over us and sing over us, it has an effect on us. We in turn can rejoice and sing because we know God is looking down upon us and he's rejoicing himself and singing over us. And therefore we can sing and rejoice ourselves no matter what's going on. And if God doesn't sing over you, you will face his condemnation. He gives you, he gives me a choice to face his wrath to face his judgment and be eternally separated in a place of torment, a place of suffering, or we can choose to have a God who not only rejoices in you through his son Jesus Christ, but sings over you. Maybe we can all agree just on a couple of facts. Maybe we can agree what God does say about us. Maybe we can agree that we are worthy of death. Maybe we can agree that we're not good enough to merit favor with God. 
maybe we can agree we're all sinners and we're deserving of it. Or we can say, I accept what you've given me in your son, Jesus Christ. Because if you do, then ultimately everything will work out. And it's true, the things which happen on this earth, the trials and the tribulation and struggle, may not be good in themselves, but ultimately we will have cause for rejoicing. Ultimately, even in the dark and the gloom, you will be able to see light. The light of Jesus Christ, which gives us the connection God uses to rejoice in us and sing with us. Jesus Christ is the only reason that God can rejoice and sing over us. He is the reason God sings over us. And if Jesus Christ is the reason God rejoices and sings over us, why wouldn't we want to be like him? Why wouldn't we want to hear him and pay attention to him and respond to him? Why wouldn't we want to serve him with all our heart? There's still time. But Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 14 says, The great day of the Lord is near and coming quickly. Just a few minutes. Mark said I was going to go long. I'm going to be short, but I knew that. I didn't want to correct her up there, okay? Whatever, it's 1108. I usually go to 1130. Sometimes it's 12. Just a few minutes. We're going to sing one more song. I'm getting serious here because maybe you've been able to say in the past, I didn't know about the wrath. I didn't know about the judgment of God. The pastor I said it hurts. All said all he had to do is raise my hand and believe and I'm okay. Zephaniah says you're not okay. You can't be complacent. And maybe you could say I didn't know about the wrath and the judgment of God before hearing this message. You, you may have thought that being complacent wasn't a sin, not serving wasn't a sin, but now you know. And after hearing this message, you can never truly say, I have never heard, so I never knew, ever again. Now you know, because today you've heard, so now you know. And you know and I know, you can't truly say, God has rejected me. But God can certainly say that some have rejected him. Please hear me. God loves you with an everlasting love. He sacrificed that which was most precious to him, his son so that he could spend all eternity with you. But he's given us a way to punish the sin without having to punish the sinner. He reveals himself to every single person, and he gives every single person a chance. He is a fair God. He is a just God. And you get to choose. Nobody else. You get to choose where you spend eternity. God loves you so much. All you have to do to bypass his judgment, to bypass his wrath, is enter into his mercy and his grace, is to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. See, everybody loves a Savior. Everybody wants to save you. The hard part is to make him Lord of your life, to surrender your will to his will. So this morning, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I want to ask you right now, will I be part of the remnant, or ask yourself that, will I be part of the remnant? Will I turn my heart towards Jesus? And I'm here to help you. Again, you know, if you just close your eyes, whether you're in the living room or, or whether you're here in the room, wherever you're at, just tell Jesus, you know, I ask you to forgive me for my sins and I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Oh, Heavenly Father, I know you're a good God. And I know you love me. But Father, I know you're a just God. And because because you're a faithful God, you reveal yourself to every single person. Father, because you're a just God, you give every single person the same chance. So, Father, I ask you today, if there be somebody today that has been complacent, if there's been somebody today who doesn't know your Son as their Lord and Savior, may they receive Jesus Christ today. Father, we thank you for the time that we've got here. We thank you for every person who is in here. Lord, we thank you for every person who may be watching on Facebook or YouTube. And Father, I pray for each person who prayed that prayer right now that you will give them the deep assurance that Jesus Christ has come into their lives and forgiven them of their sins and may receive this joy in this very moment. Mighty Lord, who is mighty to save, may we learn the lessons of your prophets. May we learn your wrath and your judgment or as much of your holiness as your love and your mercy and your grace. But Father, we thank you that you've made a way for us to escape your wrath and judgment. You've made a way for us to experience your joy. We've made a way for you to sing over us through the salvation, through Jesus Christ. Father, I every person that's sound on voice. Let us be lights on the hill to be able to share Jesus 
as he is the way, the truth, and the life that everybody we come into contact with this week. And Father, we ask this in the precious name, the name above all names, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Today is the day of your salvation. You know, maybe you want to come up here and just make the confession. Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. If somebody's watching by Facebook, put it in the comment section so we know. I mean, I know it seems so hard, but really, this is church. This is the people that love you. This is what we do here. And if you won't do it here, you won't do it there. That's right. Will you stand with me? We're going to sing one more song, only by the blood of Jesus. In the day of your day of salvation, will you come up and pray with me? Jesus died for you in public, so believe, I believe we should confess in public. And if you have a prayer need in any area of your life, you know, you can come here, the altar's open, you can stand, you can kneel by the stage. Uh, if you want me to pray with you, just let me know. I know we're in difficult times and, and people, we have social distancing, but if you want me, I'm coming over there. I know God's going to watch over us. Let's sing to the God who sings over us.